Hi everybody, tonight we're going to start our discussion of market failure. Believe it or not, this is the last section uh, consisting of four modules, of course, the last section before we start studying for the exam. So let's get right to it. First of all, market failure, what does that mean? Well, market failure defined economically is the failure of a market to provide an efficient quantity of goods and services. We've talked about markets and perfectly competitive markets, even imperfectly competitive markets, and our interest in finding out how we can make those markets either provide an efficient quantity of goods and services or explain why they don't. What we're going to talk about tonight is the beginning of four different conversations about how markets can fail. Tonight we're going to talk about the market for pollution of costs and benefits associated with pollution. So let's start with marginal social cost up here at the top. <clears throat> marginal social cost, otherwise MSC, is defined as the additional costs imposed on a society as a result of one more unit of pollution. In this case, again, marginal social cost, you might want to call it MSCP, but <clears throat> marginal social cost of this case in pollution, the additional cost imposed on society as a result of one more unit. Now, these costs include those that humans suffer, so cancer, asthma, other illnesses, but it also includes those uh, imposed on nature. So losses of species, degradation of water. Here I found a picture of some sludge from an, uh, a coal plant, coal-fired uh, electric plant here, a uh, result of acid rain. Let's look to the other side and talk about marginal social benefit of pollution. Marginal social benefit of pollution defined as the additional benefits received by society as a result of one more unit of pollution. Now that sounds a little counterintuitive. How can there be a benefit from pollution? Well, the benefit from pollution is described as the resources we don't use to prevent a ton, of, a ton of pollution. So the money that we spend, the money that we don't spend, we define as society. So in this case, the money a coal plant doesn't, a coal fire uh, power generating plant doesn't spend on more expensive coal that is actually lower emitter of sulfur the money that they don't spend on something like scrubbers in their uh, in the smokestacks. <clears throat> By allowing that ton of pollution to exist, not investing that money, those resources can be used to invest in other things. So here we look at new technologies, electric cars, the iPod, life-saving emergency technology. Uh, this is a football stadium lit up with course power from a utility and here we have a shot of Larimer Square and people out enjoying themselves. So again marginal social cost, the cost imposed as a result of one more unit of pollution, marginal social benefit, the benefits received as a result of one more unit of pollution. You may want to pause here and read this a couple of times just to make sure you get that counterintuitive idea. Now there's a trade-off and a debate going on here like any good economic concept. First of all environmentalists will argue that there's too much pollution because the electricity producers, the utilities, if they aren't regulated, they will fail to take into account the harm that pollution can do. Producers, on the other hand, of electricity argue that regulations, governmental and otherwise, unnecessarily burden their ability to create electricity, to, to produce it at the lowest possible cost. Economists see the pollution issue as a topic for cost-benefit analysis, of course, and argue that uh, we as economists should be arguing that, that we should be able to figure out an efficient quantity of pollution um, where the needs of the environment and the consumer are considered. Now this efficient quantity of pollution is also called the socially optimal quantity of pollution. Let's figure out or let's see how we determine that socially optimal quantity of pollution. Well of course being economists we'll do it in a graph <clears throat> and here we'll show marginal social cost and marginal social benefit. On the axis here we have measures of marginal social cost and marginal social benefit of pollution. And here we have quantity of pollution emitted. In this case, and this is all hypothetical, it's tons. So marginal social cost is upward sloping. Why is that? Well, when pollution levels are small down here, near zero, the next ton of pollution, so if you go from here to here, imposes very little damage to society. Nature can absorb it. Think of it as just a little bit of carbon dioxide being emitted by uh, a polluting car or a polluting power plant. Nature, the wind, will break that up and it's next to zero in terms of uh, 
long-term impact. At very high levels of pollution, the next ton can cause a much larger cost to society because in this case, in the case of pollution, nature just can't absorb it. Think about the air quality around this plant. There just isn't much fresh air to absorb this stuff. Think about these forests that are, that are suffering from acid rain. Think about this river that has all this coal sludge in it. Those are examples where the marginal social cost of the next unit, very, very high. Okay, so that again is the upward sloping curve that is marginal social cost, marginal social cost increasing incrementally as we increase the amount of pollution that's outputted. Now let's take a look at the marginal social benefit curve and you see here that it is downward sloping. sloping. Nice thing here is cost, benefit, we've seen these before sloping this way. Marginal social benefit, downward sloping. So assume that pollution is, is completely unabated. Unabated means they haven't done anything to stop it and pollution levels are very, very high. At that point, so pollution levels are very, very high. At that point here, very, very high amount of pollution. To reduce one ton of pollution, it's very easy to go from here to here. It's a small amount if you go over here and you look at marginal social benefit and the costs associated with it. So what it means is the value of the necessary abatement resources is fairly small. So the benefit of not using them to reduce pollution is small. Does that make sense? So again, it's counterintuitive. Remember, marginal social benefit is the benefit we get from not, uh, uh, from not polluting. Well, this if I'm only polluting a, if I'm only reducing my pollution a small amount, well, then I'm really not getting a large marginal social benefit because I'm not think of it as I'm not putting money back into other uses. Now. Suppose we reduce the pollution to the point where there is only one ton of pollution left in society. So let's go way up here. We've used all the low cost or easy abatement methods down here and all that remains is the most costly methods that we have. So at this point the necessary resources are extremely valuable in other uses to society. Think of it as very expensive. So if we don't use them to reduce pollution we enjoy a great deal of benefit. So the marginal social benefit up here is very, very high of actually doing what? The marginal social benefit of polluting becomes very, very high. A little counterintuitive, you may want to rewind, um, look through those or, or listen through those two. Again, these slides four and five, um, and we'll talk about them more tomorrow. Now, there is a socially optimal, optimal amount of pollution, and it's shown on the graph as QOPT, so Q optimal. And that happens naturally where marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit of, and here, of course, it's where the, the marginal social cost equals the marginal social benefit of the next ton of pollution emitted. So, this is also the quantity of pollution that makes society as well off as possible. So I can't make anybody else better off without making somebody worse off. Now, question is, will society, if unregulated, come to the optimal amount of pollution, QOPT? Unfortunately, the answer is no, they won't. Let's take a step back and think about the benefits and costs to society of pollution. So producers and consumers of polluting goods benefit. How can that be, producers and consumers? Well, producers benefit because they get money from selling the electricity, in this case. And consumers benefit because they're the ones who get to use the electricity to operate, essentially, everything they do in there. Pretty much everything you do in your life has some attachment to electricity, sort of being out and, and uh, hiking or something like that. Now, the costs, on the other hand, of pollution are imposed upon everyone and the environment. So. Think about the people who consume a plant's electricity versus those who live downwind from the power plant. So the costs of pollution are imposed upon everyone, even if I'm one of the people who gets to use the electricity from that plant. But if I'm somebody who lives downwind from the power plant and I don't even get to benefit from that, I am incurring the costs. Those downwind 
incur what are called external costs. External costs are the uncompensated costs that individuals or firms impose on each other. Now, because the unregulated market doesn't care about the costs of pollution, the polluting good, and in this case we're talking about electricity, that will be produced until the marginal social benefit of the pollution, so again, produced until the marginal social benefit of the pollution emissions is equal to zero. Let's take a look at what that looks like on a graph. So here again, we have marginal social cost here of pollution. We have marginal social benefit of pollution here. And these are hypothetical numbers. Nobody can tell us that the marginal social cost is $400 or $300 or $200 necessarily. Let's take a look at why, according to this statement, because unregulated market doesn't care much about the costs, the polluting good will be produced until the marginal social benefit of the pollution emissions is equal to zero. Well, let's take a look at that. Well, where is the marginal social benefit zero? Well, if I look, I have my marginal social cost here, I have my marginal social benefit here. Look right here. That, that is the amount that will be produced if the market simply determines the quantity of output. So at this point, Q market, the marginal social benefit of this marginal unit of pollution is actually zero. Let's see it all the way down here. If you look at marginal social cost of that next unit of pollution, it's up here. It's at four hundred. So instead of this socially optimal quantity of pollution, which is right here, where marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit, the market will produce until there is no, basically they will produce until there's no additional marginal social benefit that can be extracted from production. Again, you might, you might want to re rewind and, and think about this one a little bit. Um, spend a minute on this and then we'll, we'll have a couple concluding remarks. Okay, so what have we talked about tonight? We've talked about the idea of market failure. We've talked about using pollution as an example of comparing marginal social costs and marginal social benefit. We talked about this trade-off and debate where we're trying to figure out whether there's a socially optimal quantity of pollution. We introduced this idea of a marginal social cost and marginal social benefit and how those can be put in graphical form. We talked about why the marginal social cost is upward sloping. We talked about why the marginal social benefit is downward sloping. We reiterated why the costs and benefits of pollution are borne by society and by, uh, or, or rather, all of the members of that society. We talked about external costs, introduced the idea of external cost, and then we looked at, in an unre unregulated market, why polluters will pollute all the way until the marginal social benefit of, pollution, of polluting that next unit is zero. That's it. Have a great night. Talk to you tomorrow.